medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram update. We're going to talk about a different virus today, hopefully one that we're not going to have to talk about anytime soon. But I bring it up only because this is the largest bird flu outbreak in United States history right now. We'll talk about this. About 58 million chickens have been destroyed in the United States and 6,200 wild birds, including the bald eagle. This is something that is going on right now, and people have their eyes on it, so I wanted to talk about it so at least it was in your consciousness. This is avian influenza A, otherwise known as influenza H5N1, also known as 2.3.4.4B. So this is a flu virus. It is predominantly spread in birds. Let's go through the history of this. It was actually detected in 2020, same time as we were detecting another virus that went global. And it seems to spread by birds migration to three continents, Europe, to Africa, and also to Asia. And then in 2021, it was picked up in the United States. We could see it then because we tested animals for it. And it spread like wildfire. Actually, as we talked about, eliminating about 58 million chickens. And you can imagine the effect of that on the poultry industry. You can see here the cost of a dozen eggs based on the Midwest, large egg pricing. You can see that it's just gone up. But not only was it hitting domesticated birds, but also wild birds. And so there's about 6,200 wild birds, including bald eagles as well, that have been affected. But then they saw some things that were a little bit more concerning. They saw mammals being affected. Mammals like skunks, foxes, raccoons, bears, mountain lions, even dolphins. But in a lot of these cases, it was felt that the skunks, foxes, raccoons, and other mammals were actually feeding on infected birds, and that's how they were getting infected. So in other words, up to this point, they did not see mammal-to-mammal -mammal transmission. And this is important, of course, because the skunks, foxes, raccoons, and other mammals were much closer genetically related to human beings than they are to birds. In fact, one of the models for human transmission is a ferret, which is actually very closely related to minks, as we'll talk about. And then what they started to see was something even more concerning. This was here in the United States as well. They found in Maine about 150 seals that were dead, basically, in Maine. And when they tested them, sure enough, they had the H5N1 bird flu. And because they were all together, they felt that this actually represented mammal-to-mammal -mammal transmission. That wasn't the only place that they found it. They also found in Spain at a mink farm. I started noticing that these minks started to become sick and looked as though they had the flu, and they began dying a couple of days after they became sick. So they actually destroyed 51,000 minks in Spain. And when they did the postmortems, they found pneumonia, and when they sequenced it, of course, it was H5N1, but there was a certain aspect of this genome which was even more concerning because there was a genetic mutation that was actually very consistent with the H1N1-2009 virus that actually caused 12,000 deaths in the United States. So again, these are small pieces of evidence that may show that the virus make the jump into humans. So the question is, is have there been any humans that have been diagnosed with H5N1? The answer is yes, there have been about six of them. They have not jumped from human to human. There was one in China, in Spain, a few in the UK and US, and also one in Vietnam. The ones in the US were actually mild or asymptomatic. And of course, the concern about this is that human beings don't really have any immunity to H5N1. There are vaccines, there's about seven of them or so, that have been manufactured against H5N1 variants. And in fact, in 2020, there was a FDA-approved vaccine called Audens that was manufactured by a company called Sequiris, which we don't have at MedCrem any financial connection to. 
that was FDA approved for this most recent form of H5N1. I'll put a link in the description below to some of that information so you can see that. But the problem is that it would take about six months or so to scale up the amount of vaccines to the point that they would be protected in the general population against this type of a pandemic. Six months is quite a long time where you could have a lot of this transmission. The vaccine is not a messenger RNA or mRNA type of vaccine, but a traditional inactivated vaccine that you would normally get with a flu shot. Why do I bring this up? I bring this up not to make you uneasy. I mean, I think it's newsworthy because this is the largest outbreak of avian influenza we've ever seen in the United States, number one. Number two, it's good to know information regarding this. What we have tried to do here at MedCram is to educate you so that you have knowledge of what is going on, educate you in a way that you could prepare for such a pandemic. I think one of the biggest lessons out of the COVID-19 pandemic is early on in any pandemic, dependence on interventions that require testing, pharmaceutical approval, prescriptions, supply chains are not going to be very available to the mass general public. And we could look at examples of this. We can look at hydroxychloroquine. When it was given emergency use authorization, you could not find it in the pharmacy. I had many patients who were on hydroxychloroquine because of their lupus, and they just could not get it. It would be even worse than toilet paper, right? Because toilet paper isn't very effective at doing much in a pandemic. And yet, as it was, it was completely sold out. You could not get it. Even more so for a medication that could actually be beneficial because not only will people want to have it prophylactically, but they'll also want to collect it and be able to sell it. That's the problem when you have to have something that is scarce. And so what we've focused on here at MedCram is scalable, locally available medical interventions that would not be found scarce in a pandemic. And so we have concentrated on the benefits of near-infrared radiation, which I think there is plenty of evidence to show that that would be beneficial, is being out in sunlight, getting fresh air, getting plenty of sleep, hydrotherapy. These are all easily scalable interventions that do not require diagnostic tests or a supply chain to distribute potentially to millions of people in a pandemic such as would be caused by avian influenza A. If you're new to the MedCram channel and you don't know some of the videos that we've done on this, I highly recommend you look at our YouTube channel and you look at video titles such as Light as Medicine update on the COVID-19 series, specifically update 46 and 47. We've also talked a lot about making sure that you get enough sleep and the effects of nutrition and exercise on stress and the immune system. We've also talked about oxidative stress and how light affects that. But we've also talked about supplements. Again, supplements would require a supply chain that's why I don't have a problem talking about it, but I wouldn't depend 100% on that as a strategy because in that type of a pandemic, these sorts of things are going to be scarce. So now is the time to learn some of these techniques. Now is the time to be implementing them and getting familiar with them so that in this kind of a situation, if it were to happen, you would not only have the information and knowledge to be able to protect yourself, but also to help others and teach them as well. So I'll remind you again to subscribe to our YouTube channel, turn on notifications, leave us a comment below, and join us for more continuing medical education at medcram.com. Thanks for joining us.